Turn your bulletins if you'll stand with me this morning as we begin our scripture reading together. If you don't have a bulletin, you can follow on the, on the TV screen behind me here. This morning we'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 26, verses 20 through 21. Let's begin. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, if you'll open to Genesis chapter 7. We can dismiss our children, by the way, which I think you're already doing. (laughs) Our title this morning is Let It Rain. (laughs) When God speaks it to happen, it will happen. And we're going to go through these. We're actually going to cover chapter 7 and chapter 8 this morning. So bear with me. I think we'll get through both of them. It's a a lot of information is pretty much uh, repeated. So I think we'll be able to cover everything here. But... We're going to begin with, with verse 1 in Genesis chapter 7. says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I've seen that you're righteous before me in this generation. Now it would appear that when God tells Adam to come into the ark, God is already there. He says, what's that? Did I say Adam? When God said, pardon me, it, hey, look, it's, it's going to be a good day. <laughs> when I'm fumbling this much on the beginning, God's going to do a work. Okay. It would appear that when God tells Adam, Adam, Noah, what? hold on. That's why I should never follow my notes. You can stop videoing again. <laughs> when God tells Noah, Because he was, yeah, finally, to come into the ark, God is already on board. God is already on board. It doesn't say, Adam, go into the ark. But the word tells us, it says, Noah, come into the ark. It's an invitation. There's an invitation here. Isaiah 55, 1 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come. It's an invitation that God has for his people. And in this case, it's an invitation to Noah that says, Come, come with me and be safe. Come into the ark. Come away. You're separated. I'm separating you from the rest of the world. And as we've discussed this in many times before, we know that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. And Noah was righteous in God's eyes. He walked with God. And so when God said, come into the ark, he said, come and I'm going to protect you. Come, I'm going to seal you away. I'm going to make sure that we continue what I have set forth in plan that now your family will be the one to repopulate and regenerate the earth. So it's an invitation. Come. And Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And it's the same for us today. We know that Noah worked hard on building that ark. He worked long and hard, and we're going to get into that in just a moment. But for us today, we know that God is our rest. He is our hope. He is our peace. And it's not about a day of the week. Or it's not really about what we do or don't do as long as we're in Christ. Because if we're in Him, we are separated. We're no longer of the world. We're in it, but we're not of it. And so because of that, we're separated away from the world and we're protected because we are in Jesus just as Noah was in the ark. And we're no longer dealing with all of that stuff. Now, granted, we have the stuff coming at us. 
And as it comes at us, we know how this works. We know as the world and all the world comes at us like a wave, but we are protected from the world. We're protected from the storms because we're in Jesus. And remember when Jesus and the disciples were in the boat and the storm become raging. Well, what's Jesus doing? He's sleeping. He's not concerned. He controls the wind and the waves. He controls the storms. And so he's asleep, and the waves are getting higher, and the boat's just a-rocking, and there's a lot going on, and, and the disciples are all panicked. They run and say, Jesus, Jesus, we're all going to die. And Jesus rose and said, be still. And then he said, oh, you have little faith. Because he controls all of this stuff. He's in charge. And we know that while Satan has his hand in mixing up all this stuff around us, Jesus is stronger and more powerful than anything Satan can throw at us. And we're protected. He says, come unto me. Come unto me. And that's who we are in Jesus. And I believe that that's what he's saying to Noah here. Come in with me and I will give you rest from the work of your hands. Now we don't know exactly how long it took to build the ark. There's, there's some that believe that it was the 120 years that it took him to build it because in Genesis 6, 3, it says, And the Lord said, he's talking to Noah, he said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, so it, for indeed his flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now this is interpreted two different ways. One way is it's interpreted that from that moment on that God spoke that, that the clock was ticking until the flood. It would be 120 years and the flood would come. And the other way it's interpreted is, is this would be the longest that man would live after the flood. We know that climate changed everything after the waters came, and so man's lifespan become, became shorter. But either of these could be correct, but what we don't know is how much time had passed between Genesis 6-3 and Genesis 7-1. And so looking at, at uh, the first explanation, that the clock is ticking about the flood, we know that Noah was 500 years old, when he begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And they were already grown, and they had wives when they were called to go into the ark, and they were called to build the ark. So estimating they were anywhere from a teenage years, because, you know, back in their culture, they would marry younger. So, you know, teenage to 30 years old is a conservative estimate. And knowing that Noah was 600 years old when he entered the ark, per verse 6 in chapter 7, we could guess that it took somewhere around 70 to 80 years to build the ark. But we also have to take into consideration that the ark might have been completed and God didn't call them to go into it for a period longer. Is it possible that he gave even more grace just in case someone would repent, even though he knew that they wouldn't? We don't know, but he did say that, you know, he can't strive with man forever. But we also have to take into consideration that when they entered, we know that they also sat in the ark for a few days. And I'm going to talk about that again in a moment. But looking at the other interpretation, we know that the ages of Sarah, Moses, and Aaron, when they died, the Bible tells us this, they were all close to that 120-year-old age. Sarah lived to be 127, Aaron lived to be 123, and Moses lived to be 120. So either one of these explanations could be uh, interpreted the same way, and I'll leave it up to the more scholarly individuals to discuss that. But we do know that Noah had to have been tired, <laughs> both physically, mentally, emotionally. I'm sure he was tired because he worked diligently. When God said, do it, we covered that last week. He was obedient without question. He said, yes, Lord. And he began to build it as God specified the ark to be built. This is a big vessel. It was very labor-intensive. And building it out of obedience, he didn't know what rain really meant. <coughs> Water's going to fall from the sky. Well, I've never seen that happen. What does that really mean? And floods going to rise, and, and the whole earth's going to be covered. That's good. That had to be a phenomenal thought for, for Noah to, be, to ponder in his mind. It's something he'd never seen before, never, never even considered before. 
And I'm sure that there are many times, just as there are times with us when God calls us to do something, that we come to the end of the day and we talk to our wives or, or the wives talk to the husband and they say, I sure hope I heard God right on this. What if I miss something? What is this rain? What is this, what is this flooding? I, I sure hope I didn't miss that. Or what do you think rain really is going to be like when it comes? Do you think that they may have had those conversations? Well, he was just a man. That's what the Bible tells us. He was just a man, but he was righteous in God's eyes. Well, we're just men and we're just women. When God tells us to do something, sometimes he gives us the word to go, but then he doesn't fill in the, the blanks right away. And when he doesn't fill in the blanks, we sometimes are going on faith. Okay, Lord, I will take that step. Yes, Lord, I will move in that direction but then we, as we're moving, we're, we're kind of looking around. But, but Lord, <laughs> this feels a little odd. It feels a little different. I don't know for sure where I'm supposed to be going and doing. God says, you're doing what I told you. Just keep doing what I told you to do. Keep doing where, going where I told you to go. And when we're obedient, He reveals what we need, when we need, and the moment we need it. And that's so important for us to grab a hold of because we as humans and the minds that we have, this finite mind, we want to have all the answers. We want to be able to grab a hold of the where-tos and the wherefores and the whys and the whens and the whats and the whos and all of this stuff because we don't want to be foolish. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. It's pride. Because if we don't know all the answers and God says go and we go then Joe over here is going to come over and say, what are you doing that for? That's just stupid. And you don't have an answer to tell him why it's not stupid. He said, well, God said to do it, so I'm going to do it. And that should be enough. But pride sends us back home saying, Lord, I don't like to be calling stupid. Tell me, show me, give me, help me. And God says, do what I told you to do. I will give you what you need as you go. And you go. See, the wisdom of the world is not the wisdom of God. And when God says go, he's already got it worked out. We just have to go. Obedience, as we said last week, obedience without question. So we know that he was tired. And he was, I'm sure, in his own flesh was questioning things. But after all the work is done, God said, come inside and I will give you rest from your labor. I will give you what you need from this point forward and you will be safe from the coming destruction. And I want, to I want you to hear this this morning. This world is coming to destruction. It's, the signs are here. They're on the news. <laughs> They're everywhere you go. Only those who responded to the invitation from Jesus that says, come, will be protected from this coming destruction. As Adam and his family, and Noah, thank you, and his family, and they all came because they were obedient. And the animals came because they were told to come. And they just came. Verses 2 through 5. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, Two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Also, seven each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights. And I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. So Noah is still acting in obedience as God tells him about the animals that are about to be brought to him. Seven pairs of the clean animals and two of the unclean animals. And we know that some of the clean animals will be used for sacrifices. And we'll see that after they leave the ark. Now I do find it interesting here and curious that God has already distinguished what is clean or what is unclean, but he doesn't make this covenant with Noah in regards to what he can eat and what he can't eat until he implements the law with Abraham later. Because when Noah comes off the ark... God says all living creatures will be for food. So he's already identified what's clean, what's unclean. But then when the law is implemented for the Israelites, it will be distinguished that the clean 
you can eat the unclean. You cannot eat. I just found that interesting because that he's already, God has still got the whole picture in mind. He's still got the entire aspect of knowing what, what is true for him, and he will, he will give that to us, and he will give that to, Mo, to Moses and to everyone as he sees fit. And we're going to cover that when we get to chapter 9. But notice that after Noah entered the ark and the animals were in, they now wait seven more days before the flood begins. Seven days. Now that was probably a long week. All the animals had come in now. They're all settling down. They're all around there. The door is now closed. And they're waiting. And again, the thoughts are coming. Did I hear God right? I mean, I know he, he brought the animals. He said to do that. They, they can put a checklist together of everything that God has done to this point. They know it's happening. But now this waiting period, this waiting period, after it's complete, the work is done, they're now in, and we have seven days of waiting, hour after hour, day after day, wondering when it would begin. And what was it going to feel like when it began? It's all these questions I'm sure they had. It reminds me a little bit about the ride at Six Flags called the Free Fall. I don't know if that ride's still out there or not, but if you've ever been to Six Flags, it was this, this, this cage that you get in. It'll seat about four people. And you get in this thing, and they buckle you down, they close the cage, and you sit there for a couple minutes, and it just kind of jerks you, and it takes you straight up. And you get to the top, and then you sit there for a couple minutes, and then it just eases you out. And stops. And you wait. <laughs> and you wait. And by the time you start thinking in your mind, I wonder, whoo, that thing drops. The bottom falls out and you're gone straight down and then on your back at the bottom. And it was just like you're sitting here wondering, when is it? And it just happens. And I'm sure that this was something similar because we're going to see in a moment that this wasn't just rain. There was a big geological event that took place here. And so because of that, I'm sure when it started, it started quickly. And it came very fast. But I just find that very interesting, again, that, that God put them there and then he waited seven days before the rain would come and before the, brown, the ground was broken up. And verses 6 through 12 tells us, Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters were on the earth. So Noah with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals, of unclean, that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And so it begins, as God said it would. Now, I remember growing up and hearing the story of Noah's ark and and, and for the most part, I guess, with kids, they don't give a lot of detail. They just kind of generalize the stories. But I always just thought it was just the rain. You know, well, the rain came and, the, and it flooded everything. And, and, it, and it did. The rain came as God said it would. And it was definitely a part of it. But in verse 11, it says that the fountains of the deep were broken up. And the windows of heaven were open. So what we had here, again, was the water came up from below as well as from above and the ark's right in the middle but it was like a catastrophic event it wasn't just a rainstorm this was a geological event and remember back in genesis chapter 1 verse 7 god said that thus he made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and so it was and that water that was above the firmament had never been released it was like a canopy, if you will, over the earth. And most Christian scientists believe that this was the main contributor to longer lifespans in the earlier days. And there were other things, too. There wasn't the disease that we have. There wasn't all the aspects of, of sin when he created everything. And when sin came, it affected man, it affected the animals, it affected everybody. 
and everything, but that canopy was like a, it's like the greenhouse. They call the greenhouse effect today with the climate change and all the stuff that they spew about that. But what we're talking about here was a real canopy that God had put into place, and it was like it was protecting men from the sun's UV rays. And so the sun's exposure, again, which contributes to aging, was limited. But now this massive amount of water is released, and it's, it's in full force coming down. And it took 40 days to empty itself upon the earth. 40 days and 40 nights the rain came. And at the same time, the earth was broken up, and the water was gushing upward with mighty force. Now, personally, I believe this is when the continents were broken up. And I believe that when everything was broken up from beneath, the, the land mass was separated Water came up and divided them and spread them apart. And it was massive earthquakes forcing this water upward. And this also explains the layers that are found in the Grand Canyon and the sediments because of the pressure and the amount of water that was came up. And also, when God blew the wind and it began to drain, everything settled in a certain way. And we see evidence of this in a very localized area out with Mount St. Helens. I don't know if you guys have ever remembered that. Back in 1980, um, Mount St. Helens erupted. And the force from that, earth, or from that uh, volcano in that one spot, it forced lake waters into a very tiny area at such high pressure and high force that when that water went through and was drained, it left layers that are very similar to the layers of the Grand Canyon. And it happened instantly. Not over millions of years. Now, the biggest argument against this is they say, well, that was softer ground. That, didn't, that wasn't rock and granite like the Grand Canyon. And so I can say, okay, well, we'll say that's true. I haven't been to, the, Grand, or haven't been to the, the site where Mount St. Helens is, haven't compared rocks and soil, but let's say that's true. This is a localized, small event that the water did this in just a very instantaneous thing. We're talking about a worldwide event here. And we're talking about massive amount of earthquakes, massive probably amount of volcanoes, massive rain coming down, massive water coming up. The force of that was so intense that it could have carved anything out of anything and did so as we see the results. When the fountains of the deep were broken up, it was a worldwide event. And I believe, again, that that amount of pressure and force, I believe, is unmeasurable. I know that man maybe can calculate and come up with how much force and pressure, just like they calculate, you know, what the, what's, uh, the amount of energy is in a nuclear bomb and how big the bomb is, how much energy and all that stuff. I don't believe they can calculate this because I don't think they have all the, the, the information to plug in. We don't know how many places at that time were actually broken up. We do know that the continents are separated, but was it a complete line of water coming through? Was it just spots? We don't know. So we can't calculate that up, but it was massive. And it's inter interesting for us to ponder because nothing scripturally has ever been disproven. And there's evidence that supports scripture in every aspect of science. The problem is, it doesn't even really go back to the fact that they have a problem with God and the flood. What they have the problem with is that sin caused it. Oh, well, I don't, I'm not, I don't believe that. You know, I want to dictate my own morality. Who's anyone to say that I'm in sin? Who's anyone to say that I'm not living up to God's expectation? Well, I'll tell you who is God. And He's got a high standard. And he's got such a high standard that only one could live up to it. And that's his son, Jesus Christ. No man can ever live up to the standard of God. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. And that's why the entire world was wiped out except for eight people. Because God saw that their hearts were continuously focusing on sin and everything that was not of God. And he knew their hearts. See, God examines the heart. Men look at the outward appearance. Exactly what, what uh, God told uh, Samuel. You know, when Saul was elected, everybody loved Saul. He was a head and shoulder above everybody else. He stood tall. He was handsome. He looked good. And the people loved him. But we see what happened with Saul. 
He wasn't a man after God's heart. Only David was. And so he fell. And he fell miserably because he was disobedient to God. He didn't follow simple commands that God gave him. When he did half did half of it, some of it didn't do it all. And then he made excuses. But then we see David, the run of the litter. <laughs> I mean, Samuel came, went through all the bigger boys, all the older brothers. They were all tall and handsome. Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. N no. And then all of a sudden, he's like, you got any kids left? You know, I, got, I got the one. He's out, he's out in the field. He's, he's a shepherd boy. We'll bring him. As soon as he walked in, God said, this is the one. And he's the one. He's the smallest one of all of them at that point. Young. But what do we know of David? He was just a man. And when we get into our study in 2 Samuel this coming Wednesday night, we're going to see what just a man can do and how far he can even fall. But at the same time, we know that David was called a man after God's own heart. So we look back to Noah here. And we see Noah was a man after God's heart. Noah was a man who walked with God. And so God separated him and said, He's the one. I will use him. Verses 13 through 16. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his son with them, entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in, the, in, in which is the breath of life, went into the ark. So those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And again, what God sets forth to do, God will complete. He called them in, and he shut them in. He sealed the door. Man didn't do it himself. Important for us to understand that. Because God took every aspect of all of this all the way to the end until the waters were receded, God did it all. He beckoned Noah to come and his family. He beckoned the animals to come, two of every kind. They all came. And then the Lord shut them in. When God has a plan, he seals his plan. When he speaks a word, he accomplishes his word. When he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. But the most interesting thing about it is, looking again at the seven days that after they were in there, God does it on his timetable according to what he sees fit, how he sees fit, because he's the only one that sees the big picture. All we see is what he shows us and what we can interpret with our eyes and with our ears. And this is why it's so important, and this is a very... And I want to encourage you with this point this morning... As believers, we need to not be concentrating on what we see with these eyes. And we're not to be concentrating on what we hear with these ears. But we're supposed to be hearing from our heart by the Holy Spirit who is within us and by God's Word of which both speak, both give us direction, both give us encouragement, both gives us the plan. And if we're listening to Him and to God's Word, we can't waver. But it's when we take our eyes off of him and start listening to so-and-so said this. Well, how are you going to handle that, God? He's got a point. And what about this over here? You know, God, that makes sense. It's, this makes common sense what this guy says. And God says, I gave them common sense. I'm giving you uncommon sense. I'm giving you the spirit of God, the sense of God. <laughs> it's not common. It's supernatural. It's above commonality. It's above anything that we can process and conceive. And so here's the thing, and this is going to get you. Are you willing to look weird? Are you willing to say, I'm going to follow God no matter what the world tells me? Because you are weird. Some of you more than others. I know a lot of you. 
But welcome to the weird club. We're the club that chooses Jesus above the ways of the world. We choose God's ways over man's ways. We choose what God tells us to do rather than listening to the attitudes of the hearts of those around us who say, that doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. It didn't make any sense for, for Adam. Adam's in my head, okay? It didn't make sense for Noah to build the ark. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us. I grew up and they would say, you know, there were pictures and images and different things of, of the people on the ark trying to bang to get in. And, you know, I don't know if all of that happened. I kind of doubt it because I really believe that when it happened, it happened so quickly that they were all underwater before they could even realize what had happened. They didn't have a chance to go knocking on the door of the ark. But it probably did happen that while Noah was building the ark, people would walk by and say, what in the world are you doing? It kind of looks like a boat, but there ain't no water over here, Noah. What are you doing? And he gets closer and closer to finishing. Can you imagine what the world's harassment would have been toward a man who's following God's heart and saying, destruction's coming. I'm going inside, and they're laughing. They're mocking. Now, again, the Scripture doesn't tell us that, but we know how our culture works around us. And we know when you're talking about the things of the Lord, they laugh. They mock. They can't understand it. So it's a situation to where we have to make the choice. Are we going to be obedient to God and do what he tells us to do, no matter what man tells us? Or are we going to fall by the wayside and just kind of hide back in the shadows and say, well, God, maybe you'll use somebody else to do that. I don't, I don't really feel comfortable with that. I'm out of my comfort zone. Well, bless your heart. God wants you out of the comfort zone. He wants you out of the comfort of the world and into the rest of Jesus Christ. And He will do the work from there. But as we mentioned before, it was the Lord who, who called Noah inside the ark, and it was the Lord who shut him in, and He seals His plan. And when it comes to pass, God proves to Noah that nothing is going to happen to him, and nothing is going to happen to his wife. And nothing's going to happen to his children and their wives. And nothing's going to happen to the animals that came on that ark. Because God said, go, build the ark, get inside, and let me show you what's going to happen from there. But can you imagine the noise? I mean, you know, boat creaking and rocking. I mean, just, just itself inside that, it's going to have those creaky noises. But can you imagine when the earth broke loose? And that water came gushing up. Can you imagine how loud that was? I mean, it had to have been scary in the physical sense. The rocking and the swaying of the ark. And they didn't have Dramamine. But they had something better. They had the Lord. The Lord was with them. And Psalm 61, 3 through 4 says, For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. And I'm sure that Noah on that ark was saying, I will trust you, O God. You've done everything you said you would do up to this point. We're inside, and they're looking at each other, and that, you know, everything's going on around them. I will trust in my strong tower. And Joel 3.16 says, The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for His people and the strength of the children of Israel. The Lord is your strength. The Lord is your shelter. And He's your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Psalm 91, one thir one through 30, uh, Psalm 91, I believe it's 32, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. In Him I will trust. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is, not an easy, this is an easy thing to say. It's an easy thing to read. But when that storm is coming and those waves are rocking your boat, can you really pray them and believe them? You can when you know who wrote them. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. He who began a good work is faithful to complete that work. 
and He's faithful to complete it in you no matter how big the storm is. No matter how big the mountain is that you're facing. He's there for you. His strength is there for you. He's your refuge. He's your fortress. But here's the thing we need to understand. He's that same refuge and that same fortress when things are going along pretty good. And this is the danger zone. When things are going along okay, it's tending for our flesh to say, yeah, it's going good. Look what I did over here. And, 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 God, and you know, yeah, God's blessed me and I'm thankful, but then you just take your eyes off of God and start relishing in the blessing. And if you relish in the blessing and you're not relishing in the one who gave it, you're going to be right back where you started. And even when you are walking with Him, He will allow these trials to come. Why? Because He wants to prove Himself to you. He wants you to believe it yourself. He is writing your testimony upon your heart through these trials, through these storms. Noah has a testimony. He has a powerful testimony. And it's written in God's Word. Noah was obedient and trusted God. And today, for those who are believers of Jesus Christ, our testimony is going to be read in heaven when He opens the book and finds our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which He wrote Himself. He knows it's there. The question that we have ourselves is, do you believe? The Israelites didn't. They missed out. But we as Christians, we as, as those who have accepted Jesus Christ, as our Lord and our Savior, can know that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's our ultimate testimony. That's where it's really going to be written. But here's the thing. Before that time, before the Lord's return, before we take our last breath on this earth, you have a testimony. And some of that testimony, the beginning of it is ugly. Because we're all born into sin. And because we're born into sin, we act out in that sinful nature. And we do according to the sinful flesh. And we hurt and we wound not only ourselves but all those around us. Remember we covered this before. When, our sin, when we sin in our lives, it doesn't just affect us. It affects everyone around us. And it's ugly. But then there's Jesus. And Jesus comes and he says, I love you. And I'm accepting you right where you are. But I'm not going to leave you right where you are. I'm going to take you and I'm going to wash you in my blood. And you're going to be spotless. You're going to be that bride's, the, the, the lamb of God, the bride. You're going to be the church. And I'm going to set you apart. And I'm going to cleanse you. And then from that day forward, we're living in a relationship. Not a religion, but a relationship to Jesus Christ. And when we're in that relationship, there are going to be challenges. And those challenges are building that testimony. But we'll be able to look upon that. And other people will be able to look upon that. And they'll be able to see, you mean that's where you were? You mean that's what you were doing? And God still saved you? Yes. Yes, that's who He is. And that's who He wants to be for each one of us here. But we all have to make that choice. We all have to say, yes, Lord, Your will be done, not my will be done. Verses 17 through 24. Now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth. And the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. All that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing, and the bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the, arks wa and the, and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. 
beginning with Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. Now, I want to just interject something here. When it says God remembered Noah, it doesn't mean that he forgot him. <laughs> yeah, well, he's on the ark. God's going to go over and do his own thing for a while and then come back and remember Noah. No, he had his hand upon him. He had his, 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 his uh, breath of life upon him the entire time he's in the ark. But when it says he remembered Noah, what he's saying is, is that now that this has all taken place, I'm going to complete the plan. I'm going to now drain these waters from the earth. It's all done. I've done everything I said I would do. So that's what it means when it says he remembered Noah. He turns back to him and says, okay, now we're ready to move forward. So it says, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters had decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. And in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Then he sent out a raven which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. And she returned into the ark to ask uh, ark to him. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him any more. Now, it's interesting to look at the raven and the dove. The, the raven is a scavenger. It's, it's, a, it's a bird that, of, that just goes out. It doesn't seek live prey. It usually feeds on dead animals, eating upon dead carcasses. And when Noah sent out the raven, it said it was flying to and fro but didn't return to the ark. It doesn't mean it didn't rest somewhere. And probably it rested on some of the carcasses and was feeding itself. And there's some believe that it might have went back to the ark but didn't come in the ark kind of rested on the ark. But whatever the case may be, we know that it was not representative of the dove. It would come back and fly around, but it would not land. Now, Matthew Henry says this about the raven and the dove. He says that some make these things an allegory. The law was first sent forth like the raven, but brought no tidings of the assaging waters of God's wrath with which the world of mankind was deluged. Therefore, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his gospel as the dove, in the likeness of which the Holy Spirit descended. And this presents us with the olive branch and brings in a better hope. And we kind of see, even there, there's a representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The raven was in the flesh, and the dove was representative of the Holy Spirit. And the dove is a symbol of peace. We have the dove behind us here this is uh, a, a kind of a symbol of, of calvary chapel movement we don't worship the dove we don't idolize the dove but it's a reminder it's a reminder that the holy spirit came and rested upon the shoulder of jesus as a dove and we have that same rest that the holy spirit comes to us and we have that peace and we have that joy and we have that better hope all because of what Jesus did for us. In verses 13 through 19, And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you, Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons, his wife, and his sons, wives with them. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. So we're going to look at the timeline on the flood here. 
and it should come up behind me on the screen, but day number one, God calls Noah and his family and the animals into the ark. Day number seven, the floodwaters come. Day number 47, the rain stops, and all the water stops from coming up from beneath. Day 150, the flood begins to recede. Day number 224, mountaintops begin to show. Day number 264, Noah sends out the raven. Day 271, Noah releases the dove. Day 278, Noah releases the dove a second time. Day 285, Noah releases the dove the third time. Day 314, Noah releases the cover of the ark. And day 370, God tells Noah to leave the ark. That's just over a year. That's a long time. God sent them in the ark. He closed them in. And they were in there for just over a year. Could God have done it any faster? Yeah. God can do anything he wants to. He could have actually taken them up, flooded the earth, drained the earth, and then brought them back down if he's so fit. He could have done anything he, he wanted to do. So why so long to deliver them from all that was going on around them? Does that not seem like familiar questions that you find you're asking yourself day after day? God, when? I've been praying. I trust you. You've separated me. I know I'm separated. I know I'm in you. When is this going to stop? When, is, when are we moving forward from this place that I feel like I'm in a rut? I feel like I'm, I'm just kind of bogged down. And this is what some people call the, the desert place. You're not truly in a desert because God is right there with you. But what he hasn't given you is the direction in the desert yet. Because when you're in the middle of the desert, it all looks the same. Sandy and dry and desolate, and you feel alone. But this, again, is a situation that we don't trust our feelings. It's not about your feelings. It's about faith. It's about trust. It's about recognizing who God is. And if you're in a desert you can be sure that he placed you there for a season and for a reason. Think about this. When Jesus was tempted by the, by the devil, what does it say? The Holy Spirit led him into the desert for 40 days. And he fasted. He fasted for 40 days in the desert before he was tempted. So when you're in this desert... Maybe what you need to be doing is fasting and praying and seeking and knocking. Not out of desperation to get out of the desert, but more of, Lord, pour into me while I'm in this desert what I need when I come out. Because I can guarantee you when you come out of that desert, there's going to be things that are going to be tempting you. There's going to be things that are going to be coming after you. And the season of the desert in the Spirit is that we're to desire more of God, more of Jesus, more of His Word, more faith, more whatever He has for us. That's what we should be doing. But you know what happens is the flesh gets involved. And the flesh starts saying, I don't want to be here. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Isn't that what we heard from the Israelites in the desert? complain, moan, and groan. And they had to stay there 40 years. And that generation never saw the promised land because they didn't believe. You're going to go through the deserts. Sometimes the Holy Spirit leads you there. Sometimes it may be because we've had sin and God brings us to this place so that we come to the place of repentance from that sin. Sometimes it may be because of oppression from the enemy and from people in our lives. There's all different ways that the desert place comes. But what happens in the desert place is between you and the Lord. And you have to choose what you're going to do in that time. Are you going to complain? 
Or are you going to trust? Are you going to ask and demand? Or are you going to ask that the Lord's will be done? That's your choice. And the longer you rebel, the longer you stay. And if you try to fight your way out of it, I advise you not. Because it only leads to a hotter desert. (laughs) When you're there, you need to be seeking Him. But these are the questions that we have today. How long, O God? When will this be over? And God will do what He says He will do. He will lead you through that desert. He will lead you through that period. Just as He led Noah into the ark and kept them there for over a year, He protected them during that time. He guarded them during that time. He's doing the same for you. But how long you're there is not according to your timeline. It's according to His. But who knows? Think of it this way. As Noah was protected from all the destruction around him, who knows that God may have you in an uncomfortable desert place to protect you from all the garbage that's around that He doesn't want you to be involved in. And He's got you hid away in a place you're not comfortable but a protected place. He knows what he's doing. We've got to trust him. We've got to trust him. He does what he sees fit in order to achieve the outcome that he desires. But the outcome that he desires is the outcome that's going to be best for us. Always. It's going to always be the best for us. But what's best for us is not what our flesh wants. What our flesh wants is what our flesh wants. I want to be comfortable. I want to be happy. I want to be satisfied. I want to have all the food I can have in front of me at any given time, plus those sour cream donuts and Little Debbie snack cakes. I want all that. I want my bank account to be full so I don't have to worry about it. I want to be healthy until the day that I die. Well, that doesn't quite make sense. Of course you'd be healthy until the day you die, I guess. Or until the Lord comes back. I want everything to be comfortable and easy going. And God says, I'm calling you, come in. You may not be comfortable in your flesh, but that's not where you need to be anyway. Come in let me fill your spirit. All who are thirsty, come. Buy milk without money, buy food, buy everything you need. Without money, without cost, because it's given to us. He paid the cost. He paid the price. We need to be where he wants us to be. Some interesting information regarding cultures around the world that speak of the flood. Of more than 200 cultures that have their own account of the flood, the following aspects of the story are are in common. 88% of the 200 cultures describe uh, a favored family. 70% of the 200 cultures attribute survival to a boat. 95% of the culture say the sole cause of the catastrophe is a flood. 66% say that the disaster is due to man's wickedness. 67% record the animals are also saved. 57% describe that survivors end up on a mountain. And many of the accounts also specifically mention birds being sent out, a rainbow, and eight persons being saved. Now, these are cultures all over the world. Talking about 200 different cultures. They all have records. They had people somewhere along the line that told the story. And behind them, they told the story. And it goes all the way back until they come off of it. And they they lived it. (laughs) Noah and his family. So when you have all of this in front of you, why is it so hard to see and believe? It's because we don't want to trust that God is God. And we would rather fill the story what we want it to be to make it more culturally sensitive. Not to offend anybody. Not to wound those tender-hearted little people that can't handle God's truth. I'm sorry. If it offends, you need to go to the one who wrote it. Deal with Jesus on it. And I guarantee you, you'll come out either understanding or more rebellious, but one way or the other, you need to go to the source. Go to the Word. The Word is true. And the Word is faithful. Verses 20 through 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. 
Then the Lord said to his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living creature as, as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Now, verse 22 is the primary reason that I don't buy into the global warming scheme that these climate change alarmists have been spewing out at us all these years. And they've been doing it since I can remember, and they've been wrong since I can remember because we shouldn't be here based on what they told us in the 70s and 80s. I mean, we'd be gone already. It simply goes against God's Word. God plainly says, as long as the earth remains, the seasons will come and go as they always have. And we read in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, says that now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. This all takes place after the tribulation period. This takes place after the thousand-year reign, of which God and His saints will come back and reign on this earth. And it takes place after the great white throne judgment. And then this earth will be removed and destroyed. And then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So don't worry that your car emissions is too high and your carbon footprint is way too high. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be, you know, cautious about the, the wastefulness that we have sometimes on energy. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is, is that don't buy into by the 2035, it's all over. We can't believe what the world tells us. All of these things are future events, and therefore, no matter what Al Gore and his white lab coat minions tell you, the truth is, is it's all in God's Word. If you want to know what happens in the end, go read it. If you want to know what happens in the beginning, read it. Come here and we'll, we'll, as we're going through the beginnings. As you want to know what's happening right now, get on your knees. Seek Jesus. Desire Him above all things. Study His Word. Draw near to Him, and He will draw near to you. Seek Him, and you will find Him. It's time that we as believers quit trying to analyze God's Word through worldly filters. And this is where the church has to stand up. This is where the church globally has to stand up. I'm not for globalization as it's, as it's spewed out in the government. I'm for Christian globalization because it's truth. And when the church all across the world comes to the point that they quit buying in to the world's decisions and the world's ways and the world's problems and the church quits letting them come in the front door by doing it this way and that way so you get bigger crowds and make it a show and you don't want to talk about this because it'll offend you. You can't do that. And they get rid of all that garbage and get back to the Word of God. Teach the Word of God in season and out of season. Be prepared. You need to be prepared. When people come to you and they're hurting, you need to be able to show them Scripture where they can find their hope. And on top of that, you need to be living that light so people can see it. Don't cover it. Let it shine. But the problem is, is we use worldly filters and worldly ways to try to explain God. You can't. God is a spirit. I mean, He is, he is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all-wisdom. Man can't even fathom the, 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 imp, the nothing of God except through His Word and through the Holy Spirit, which we have. The two sources that we have to live our lives in accordance to God's plan is the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Why do we not take advantage of both? And when I say take advantage, I don't mean in a worldly way. I mean in a spirit way. Go to the source. Go to the source. It's where you're going to find it. And He will give you what you need. But if you just live your life as though, well, I prayed the prayer, it's off my checklist, it's done. Now I can do what I want to do, and I look forward to going to heaven at some point. I'm sorry, you won't be going to heaven unless you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about a prayer you prayed. It's about the attitude of the heart. That's what it's all about. The world denies creation. They deny the flood and anything they can't explain. But God's wisdom far exceeds anything that man can even consider in his mind. As I said earlier, as we 
go from from this building and we go home and and we're filtering life and we're going through all this stuff. We need to listen from here, not from here. We need to see from here, not from here. We need to be seeking the fullness of His Spirit, the fullness of His Word. We need to be asking for that protection. He's already promised us when, when He said, If you come unto Me, I will give you rest. He's already promised us that all that receive Me will find that rest. He's given us the promise. Why don't we just respond? Here I am, Lord. I'm coming into your ark. I'm coming into your presence. I want you to hide me away. And again, I want to make this point very clear. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to understand something. I'm not telling you that your physical life is going to get easy. It won't. And that's a lie if somebody tells you you get saved and have anything you want and life's just a dream. No. You get saved, be prepared for the ride of your life. The ride of your life, it won't be pleasant in the flesh always. God gives you those seasons. He gives you wonderful times that you enjoy. But He also brings you into those deserts. And then while you're there, He's saying, Seek me, trust me, depend upon me, listen to me, come unto me. And I will give you rest. He is our rest. Do you believe that this morning? If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Father, we do believe this morning and we come. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus for those around us who who we come in contact with daily that don't know this truth, Lord, that don't know you, that have never accepted you, have never trusted you. Father, I pray that you will reveal yourself to them as we pray for the lost in our families as we pray for the lost and in in friendships that we have and, and work relationships and wherever we are, Lord, we come across people day in and day out that don't know you. And Lord, sometimes they can't see you in us because we are too afraid to stand up and do right. We're too afraid to stand up and, and say yes, Lord, in the midst of a dark situation because we don't want to look odd and foolish. Well, what was the old song that said, if I'm a fool for Jesus, whose fool are you? Lord, we need to be a fool for you. And I use that word lightly because I don't know what other word to use, Lord. We want to be, we want to be humble before you. We want the pride gone. And I pray right now, Lord, that, that this church body, those who might be hearing online, whoever it is, that our believers this morning, that they would come to you right now and say, Lord, no longer do I want to live in the flesh Monday through Friday and Saturday and then come to church on Sunday. No longer do I want to just just do what church people do on Wednesdays and Sundays. But I want to know what this relationship is all about. And I want to know what your word has to say about the world that we live in. And I want to turn the news off. And I want to turn off all the chat and the chatter that just just, is a distraction. Lord, man cannot fix man's problems. Because man's problem is sin. But you've already dealt with sin. So I pray right now, again, Lord, I pray for those who do not know you. If they know you, if 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 there's even an inkling in their heart that they need you right now, I pray in the name of Jesus that they would open their hearts unto you. And they would just speak to them and saying, I am your rest, I am your hope, I am your salvation. And Jesus wants you to know right now that if you seek Him and you ask for Him, He will give you the desire of your heart. But He must be the desire. And then from there, He will pour into you the desires that will fulfill your life in accordance to His plan. And Lord, for those again who are believers who are just walking that, that fine line, one, one foot in, one foot out, It's a dangerous place, Lord. It's a lukewarm place, if you will, and that's what you say in Revelation. When you're speaking about that, you say you just spew that out of your mouth. The lukewarm. They're not pleasing to you. It's only those who love you, who trust you, who choose you above all things. Those are the ones that are your people. So we come, Lord. We ask, we seek, we knock. And I pray in Jesus' name for those who are in the desert right now. I pray, Lord, that they would see you right there with them. Just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were standing in that fiery furnace. And all of a sudden, there was a fourth man appeared there with them. 
You delivered them from that. But Lord, they were in it. They were in it. Now their clothes weren't burned. The only thing that was burned off of them was the ropes that bound them. They didn't even smell like smoke when they came out. But Lord, you were there with them. They still went into it. And so Lord, we have to understand that we're going to be into these fiery trials, but we're not to be surprised by them, but we're supposed to be counting it joy because you're there with us. That's a spiritual thing. It's not a fleshly thing. The flesh has to die in order for the Spirit to bring us joy in the midst of these, these difficult times. May we choose this morning that our flesh be dead and that your Spirit live inside of us. We love you, Lord. We praise you and we thank you. We glorify the name of Jesus. And we come because you say come, we come. And we're eager for your presence. We're eager for your word. We're eager for your voice. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen.